Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Melissa Broder to discuss her novel, Milk Fed, a scathingly funny, wildly erotic, and fiercely imaginative story about food, sex, and God, published by our friends at Scribner. Melissa Broder is the author of the novel, The Pisces, the essay collection, So Sad Today, and four poetry collections, including Last Sext. She has written for the New York Times, L.com, Vice, Vogue Italia, and New York Magazine's The Cut. Her poems have appeared in Poetry, The Iowa Review, Tin House, and Guernica, and she's the winner of a Pushcart Prize for Poetry. We are in for a treat. I'll take a moment to remind you that you can order your copy of Milk Fed or any other book from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. And every purchase you make supports Books and Books, so don't be shy. And we thank you for your generous donations too. Melissa's gonna fly solo tonight and we'll take some questions and she will also take some questions from the audience. So please post your questions anytime during the broadcast in the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Melissa to the virtual stage. Hi, Melissa, welcome. Hi. Hi, Miami folk and non-Miami folk. Um, I'm wearing my airbrushed Miami inspired t-shirt. Um, thank you all so much for coming to this virtual event for my new novel, Milk Fed. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the book and then um, I am going to talk a little about the book and then we're gonna, um, if you all have questions about um, the book or um, my philosophy of life after death or anything you wanna talk about, um, we can, you can ask me questions. So, um, so Milk Fed, uh, the protagonist of Milk Fed is a woman named Rachel. She's 24 um, and calorie restriction is her religion. She was born and raised a Jew, more of, more of like a secular kind of Chanel bag Jew than a Talmud Jew. Um, and um, she now lives in Los Angeles and works at a talent, major, talent management agency, which is not her dream. Um, and at lunch every day, she has her food ritual. She goes to Subway and gets a very specific 160 calorie salad. And then following Subway, she goes to Yo Good, her yogurt shop, and gets a very specific yogurt filled only to the top. And she loves the server at Yo Good. His name is Adiv. Um, he is an Orthodox Jew. And um, he takes his yogurt. He, you just don't find food service like Adiv every day. He takes. He knows that yogurt is a is a substance of. It's very serious business. So um, Rachel loves that experience, and he's much um, he's much easier for her to work with than the sandwich artists at Subway, who tend to sometimes give her um, a little flack about her order. Adiv gives her no flack. So. Rachel has just embarked on a 90 day detox from her controlling mother and she is at work and she goes to lunch um, at, she goes to get her yo good. And when she gets there, um, Adiv, the server is gone. And in his place is a very Zoftig, um, mystic mensch, I'll call her a kosher coquette named Miriam. Um, and Miriam begins to, and Miriam is, is very voluptuous and very comfortable in her body. And she begins to peer pressure Rachel, um, into, uh, toppings and a Sunday and, um, you know, perhaps a whole way of life, um, a whole new way of life. So this is, um, I'm going to read two scenes. This is Rachel's first encounter with Miriam and Rachel's been been staring at her. When she caught me staring at her, she said, what can I get for you? She said it nicely and briskly as though she didn't care that I'd been staring. I'll have the sugar-free fat-free cappuccino swirled with the sugar-free fat-free cheesecake, I said, medium. 
She reached for a large cup. No, I said, medium, the 16 ounce one. She put the large cup back and picked up a medium cup. Oh, I said, also, I only want it filled to the top of the cup, like not over the lip. She nodded that she understood. Then she pulled the lever and I heard the whir of the machine. I watched closely as she rotated the cup under the swirling yogurt. She was good, precise, leaving no pockets of air, just how I liked it. But as the yogurt approached the top of the cup, she showed no signs of slowing down. That's enough, I said softly. She didn't stop. The yogurt took a full lap above the rim. That's enough, I called out loudly this time. She raised the lever on the machine, halting the flow of yogurt. Then she turned to me. It's priced by cup size, not by weight. We won't charge you for the extra, she said. Oh, I said casually, okay. She pulled the lever again and the flow of yogurt resumed. The swirls piled higher and higher, forming a creamy glistening castle that towered high above the cup. What toppings do you want, she asked, clearly not finished with destroying my life. Uh, none, that's okay as it is, I said. Nothing, she asked. Yeah, I like it plain. She looked at me incredulously, but I couldn't worry about what she thought because I had other problems. There were 32 ounces of yogurt in my 16 ounce cup. I needed a strategy. I could eat the Northern hemisphere of the yogurt down to the rim, then throw the Southern half away. But that seemed sad to me. Who wanted to stop? It would be much more pleasant to lop off the top half and then have the rest of the cup to enjoy. But where could I get rid of it? I couldn't just throw the offending portion away in front of her. I was going to have to go outside to do surgery on the yogurt. I found a trash can by the curb and was then met with another problem. It had no hole. It was one of those California architectural sanitation masterpieces with a puny slot. There was no way to dump out the offending portion of yogurt all at once. I could scoop off small spoonfuls gradually, but then I needed leverage, something upon which to tap the spoon and release the blobs of yogurt into the slot. I wasn't about to touch the spoon to the can. I scooped a small spoonful of yogurt out of the cup. Then I wrapped the spoon against my phone just over the slot. This wrapping motion provided enough friction to dislodge the yogurt. I scooped again, then wrapped, scooped, wrapped. I became so focused in my work that I didn't see NPR Andrew walking right by me. Andrew is Rachel's coworker who sits across from her and judges her use of uh, fake sweeteners. Uh, she calls him NPR Andrew because he's into like NPR and um, like Scandinavian films for the sake of their obscurity and like natural peanut butter. Hi, Rachel, he said. I looked up mid wrap. He was wearing earbuds and sunglasses. He had a smirk on his tiny face. He continued walking. So the little shit had witnessed my process. I felt violated, disgraced. I prayed that he couldn't fully comprehend what he had seen. At the very least, he knew it was something freaky. Well, my yogurt was ready. I could eat in self-disgust and peace. Okay, and then I'm going to read another scene, a later encounter between Rachel and Miriam, but um, my dog wants to be part of the reading. This is Pickle. So I'm just gonna allow him to be part of, to be part of the reading, but you have to be good. Okay. You'll just know he's here. He's not impressed. He doesn't care how many books I publish. Okay. So this is a little later and um, Rachel returns to Yo Good after having to kind of deal with Miriam's presence there, totally throwing a jackknife in her food ritual. Um, and, she, and Rachel sees that Adiv has returned. A great miracle occurred. Adiv returned. Shalom, I called out when I saw him behind the counter. Shalom, he said, looking confused. Never, I was sure, had any customer been so happy to see Adiv back at it. This was my burning bush, my Noah and the Ark and the Dove. I was to be captain of my dessert realm again. No more peer pressured extras or yogurt in conversation. I wondered how his experience in Israel had been, what his views were. But a food service interaction seemed an inopportune time to say, 
Hey, any thoughts on a two-state solution? I'll have the cheesecake, I said, omitting any discourse on land disputes. Then Miriam emerged from the back. Hey, Rachel, she said, signaling that she'd handle me. Oh, hi, I said. Be useful and go unbox the pretzel cones, she said to Adiv. Adiv complied. I watched her grab a 16 ounce cup and pull the lever on the machine. The yogurt began its ascent, swirling upward until it overtook the brim, entering the unsafe space above it. But then it transcended that realm, soaring to a new unthinkable altitude before reaching a summit that was miles above where she began. Even for Miriam's style, the serving was absurd. I want to give you a free topping, she said, because you didn't like your last yogurt. Miriam had caught Rachel uh, dumping out half the yogurt in the dumpster behind the store. That's okay, I said, I don't want one. Come on, she said, there has to be something you like. What about sprinkles? I'm just gonna put a little sprinkle on it, just a little. Rainbow, I said instinctively, then thought, fuck. I watched her spooning on the sprinkles and noticed for the first time that she had lovely fingernails, smooth and egg-shaped, trimmed neatly. She wasn't a biter like me, a compulsive habit that began in childhood as something of a snack. Now I painted my nails red as a deterrent, but I only ended up biting off the polish too, spitting flakes of crimson. When she handed me the yogurt, every inch of that mammoth peak was covered in rainbow sprinkles. It was gorgeous seamless, as though the yogurt were a rainbow itself, no separation between dessert and topping. Its beauty made me think for a moment that sh it should have always been this way. I stared at the sculptural masterpiece in my hand. I wanted to kiss it, to make out with it, to touch it with my tongue and lips and explore what those tiny textures felt like. Simply holding the cup, I was rocketed back to Sprinkle's past, I remembered that they were actually made of tiny bits of dried frosting and the way you could dissolve them in your mouth, suck until they were softened back to frosting once again, com completing one of life's great cycles of transformation. See, said Miriam, everyone loves a topping. I smiled at her and felt weak. Then, as though compelled by an otherworldly force, I brought that majestic mountain to my mouth, licked it, and took a bite. Mmm, I said with my mouth full. Thanks. I closed my eyes. The sprinkles were so delicious, melting there on my tongue, that my throat began to call out for them. What would be the harm? What would be the harm, said my throat? What would be so bad about just swallowing? Of course, I knew what the harm would be. Sprinkles were loaded with sugar, and there was no way of knowing how many of them were packed into any given mouthful. From one bite to the next, it would be impossible to calculate a caloric load. Panicking, I spun on my heel and headed for the door. I hoped that I could keep the concoction in my mouth long enough without swallowing to get to the trash can on the curb. But when I reached the can, my lips would not open to relinquish the mouthful. I stood there and swallowed it down my gullet. Then, to my horror, I found myself sticking my tongue into a crevice between yogurt and cup. Where a, small, where a small pile of naked sprinkles had fallen. I licked them out. I didn't stop, but pressed on to where the sprinkles and some drips of melted yogurt had formed a viscous union. I chewed these bites up quickly and swallowed again and again, as though this, this were the fastest way to get rid of them. While I ate, I watched myself, like I was hovering up above, split into two beings. One of me was the one doing the eating. The other observed myself in shock as I continued to devour it all. Stop, stop, called out the observer me, but it was no use. I was consumed by the yogurt, all five senses bathing in its drips and swirls, as though I had entered some yogurt door. No thought, no vision or sound, but the yogurt and its sprinkles. Any fear or hesitation fully eclipsed by the sensation, the crunch, the slurp, the melt, the heavenly feeling of cleaning each side evenly with my tongue, hardness and softness, sweetness and more sweetness, a prism of beauty on earth and above it, and me, the me on the ground, nothing but a giant mouth and tongue, eating and eating for nothing, not one thing except sheer pleasure alone.
I don't know how long I stood there in front of the trash can, devouring, licking, swallowing. I only knew that when my mind and body were finally united again, the first thing I noticed was the, sm was the sour smell of trash in the warm sun. I felt afraid, then a hot shame. It had really happened. I'd eaten the whole thing. All that remained was a dribble at the bottom with two sprinkles floating in it, one pink and one blue. I dug them out with my spoon and put that last little bite in my mouth. Something had taken me over, possessed me, some phantom transmitted from Miriam to me, or a demon lurking latent all these years, now suddenly awakened. I had not lost control like that with food since I was 16. I'd thought the demon was dead. No, that wasn't true. I'd sensed the demon in me all along, waiting for the right moment to open my mouth, suck the world down my throat. All of my restriction, my efforts at control, as I tiptoed daily around the edge of hunger, were enacted in the name of keeping that demon shut up. Sleep, sleep late to delay calories. Write everything down. Eat ice. Avoid friends. But in all that busy work, I'd forgotten what made the demon space so dangerous in the first place. When you were in it, it felt fucking great. So that is an excerpt from Milk Fed. And um, since I am alone talking to the void, I um, I was thinking about what I wanted to say. Um, cause it, and uh, so a lot of times as a writer, when you're doing interviews and things like that, people love to talk about your process. Um, you get a lot of questions about your process and you also get a lot of questions about inspiration for the book. And um, I was thinking about like, what were my inspirations? I, I, well, I'm not gonna talk about process. Though if, you, if one of you have a question about process, I'll answer that. But um, nobody, I mean, the process for me is like, you know, I'm alive, it's uncomfortable, I have to do something and I write. So um, to alleviate the tension of existing. So that's like sort of my basic process. But um, so, but I kind of made like a glossary of different little, of things that like inspired the writing of this book. So I just thought I would go through a couple of those things um, in this little glossary of inspiration from Milk Fed to explain more about the book. And then um, I'll take questions. So uh, the first, and it's alphabetical. So the first is body, is the first item in this glossary of ins inspiration. So body, see also dysmorphia, see also living in one. See also spiritual being having human experience I didn't ask for. See also, I used to think that spirituality was like, I'm over here on a lotus and I'm on some like really good heroin -y ecstasy and humanity is over here and no one can touch me. But over time, I've kind of come to see it more as a process of learning how to sort of be okay with being human in a body, a human among humans. Um, and see also... Um, do you ever like, uh, do an exercise class? I guess it, we, we used to all go, you know, people used to go to them. Now we do them at home, but, and, um, the teacher is like, remember why you came here today. Like pat yourself on the back. Remember what you're here for. And I'm always like, uh, I'm here because I hate myself and can't let myself live in peace. So that's all sort of my experience of the body. Okay. Number, uh, certitude. So I don't love certitude. I think there is more mystery and magic and uh, in the questions. And I definitely say that my spiritual path is, you know, I was raised Jewish, but I think that um, I'm sort of of the philosophy that like truth is one and paths are many. But I feel like in 2021, um, there's a lot of encouragement uh, to, be, to be sure um, and certain, particularly morally. Um, and I think, you know, we're encouraged. We construct personal brands. We like memoji ourselves. We proclaim our political and tribal allegiances. Um, and Milk Fed is really a book that, um, I, that I think challenges certitude. Um, and I was curious, like, how do we know what we know to be true? Um, what are we being fed? Um, can belief of the intellectual or emotional variety make something true? 
um, can conflicting beliefs that are held deeply by warring individuals or groups both be true at the same time, simply based on the nature of them of, of the dedication of belief. And also how do we live when uh, a conflict of belief uh, exists within us? So when we hold various conflicting beliefs. So these were all things that I was, um, these were all, these were all things I was thinking about in writing the book. Um, okay, next is Roth, comma, Philip, Philip Roth. So Philip Roth, um, I'd say that some North, some of my North stars um, have been his books, Sabbath's Theater and Portnoy's Complaint, um, and particularly uh, Goodbye Columbus. I remember when I was like 10 or 11, reading the book Goodbye Columbus, it was my dad's copy. And I remember seeing the protagonist, Neil Klugman's description of um, the Jews he, in his family that are sort of a, like a tuna salad -y Newark Jew versus um, his love interest, Brenda Potemkin's family, who are more of like a, a nouveau riche, nose jobbed, fresh fruit, sporting goods falling from the trees kind of Jews and sort of like different types of Jewiness. Um, and I just knew what that meant on every level, you know, like I, I felt like I had never understood something so deeply. Um, and so, um, and Roth, um, you know, he gets into, he gets into God, sex and food. And, um, I think the inextricable nature of those appetites, right? Like we try to compartmentalize hunger, desire and familial longing and, um, spiritual searching, but to me, and really the, I think like one of the main themes of milk fat is that they're all connected. You can't separate those. So, okay. The next item in the glossary, I'll just read like a couple more, um, is tuna salad. So to me, food and Judaism are really inextricable. Um, it's a very tuna salad -y religion. And um, my earliest memories of Judaism are making a diorama of a sukkah. For those of you who don't know what a sukkah is, it's the um, it's an outdoor hut made of fruit and twigs um, where you sleep, where, where Jews sleep during the harvest time to give thanks for the harvest. Um, but we would make these dioramas of them, these small ones at Hebrew school out of like graham crackers and icing. And I remember stealing the ingredients and binge eating them. Those are like my earliest like religious memories. So we're like binge eating this this holy thing um or like my mom would give me like a dollar to give to sadaka which was the charity at the synagogue and i'd go to the little shop in the synagogue and i would spend the dollar on myself getting as much chocolate gelt and pretzels as i could get um that's a confession and so um and a few years ago i started feeling this longing for the cultural judaism of my childhood and i couldn't figure out why because i live in los angeles there's no shortage of jews here it's like basically filler on the roof. Um, it's like a giant Jew. Um, but I realized that what I was missing was actually this feeling of innocence that I felt um, from my childhood when I would go with my grandparents to places like Ratner's, which was a dairy restaurant in New York and is no longer open, um, or, or Second Avenue Deli, which is open, but is no longer in the East Village. It's moved uptown, or Gus's Pickles. Um, and at the time, that really felt like unconditional love to me. The food and the love were inextricable. Um, later on, I sort of began to question some of the beliefs that I was being fed along with, um, you know, that love. And um, I was examining some of those beliefs and um, the nature of unconditional love in um, writing Milk Fat. So um, the next entry I have for my glossary is unconditional love. So I, I feel that I've always feared judgment from some kind of like cosmic arbiter. Um, and then later I kind of started to realize, I was like, oh, it's just my mother. Um, you know, I think our parents are our first gods. And um, the self-love industrial complex, which is booming right now, um, it makes it seem like self-love is something that you can like arrive at or purchase or it's like the end of a destination and you're born whole. Um, you know, you like you become enlightened and that's it. But like in my experience uh, thus far, um, there's it, there's no rival. 
it's not an arrival. Um, you know, and, and my ideas of perfection have always been sort of messed up and warped. Like they're often based, my ideas of perfection or what I need to be or what I'm supposed to be are often based on lack and striving. Um, and a few years ago, I looked up the definition of perfection in the dictionary um, and I didn't like a lot of the ones I found, but there was one that I love and it said perfection, lacking nothing essential to the whole. And, um, you know, it made me think like, I do lack, I'm not this whole person who has like arrived, um, but I have all I need. I lack nothing essential to the whole. And in that way, like I'm already perfect. You're already perfect, right? We lack nothing essential. And um, these were all ideas that I was exploring um, in creating the char character of Rachel and her odyssey from, um, you know, the ideas of, of what she believes she needs to be and what she is fed and what she believes that the, what she believes is truth, um, what she believes is truth and what she has to be, um, you know, and they say a miracle is a shift in perception and Rachel um, encounters uh, various miracles because um, she undergoes various shifts in perception in the book. Um, and then the last is God. Um, so, oh, I guess that was out of order. That's not alphabetical, but um, so God, but God, you know, we can end with God because God's like, I mean, what's bigger? So, all right. So in Milk Fed, um, every character is more than one religion. Um, but their denominations often stray from the theological. So gods are made of familial approval, love, the illusion of control. Um, and it's just like, what are you making your higher power? Um, money, love, familial approval, success, validation, validation, and even atheists have gods. So um, for Rachel, Rachel begins the book as an atheist, but she certainly has a god and her gods are perfection and like her own her own skewed ideas of perfection um and control so um and then over time um as she changes as she transforms in the book um she comes to explore different ideas of god both on earth and also um through her interactions with miriam and miriam's family um who are orthodox jews um, and yeah, um, so that is pretty much, that's all I want to say. I'm going to take questions because we have about 17 minutes. All right. How long did it take you to write the Pisces? Um, so it took me, I would say about three years. So my, okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about process. So my process for writing novels this far has been, I usually dictate the whole first draft. I encourage myself to let it be as messy as possible because I'm a perfectionist and I have to kind of trick myself into, um, not editing anything on the first draft. So I'll use Siri and, uh, notes like a simple note. It's called simple note app. Um, and, um, I will dictate the book. And even if I see that there are errors, I will not go back and correct them. And I'll do like three paragraphs a day. And then over time, um, once, I, and that takes about nine months. And then, um, and then I go back and there's probably maybe like, I don't know, with Milk Fed, Milk Fed, I've never edited something so much as I've edited. I mean, I probably did like 40 rounds at least. Every time I thought I was done, I'd get like a letter, an editorial letter. They're called these letters you get from your editor and, um, and you get the letter and I would like open the letter and then like have a nervous breakdown. Cause I thought I was more done than I was. And it was like, Oh no, I have to go back into the weeds. Like I have to do major surgery or I have to go back into the weeds. I thought it was just, I call it the weeds. And like, I never want to go back in the weeds. You know, like I'm scared of the weeds, but then like once I like get in the weeds, I'm actually like, I love the weeds. Like the weeds is like kind of my only reason for living. Like when I'm like in the, when I'm like living in pajamas and like just in the weeds with these characters every day, that's like the happiest I ever am. Um, because I'm like not thinking about myself, but I forget that I love the weeds. And so like when you're standing outside the weeds and you're like, I don't have to go back into the weeds. I'm going to maybe like just trim a little, you know, like copy edits. And then you realize you have to go back into the weeds. It's like, um, it's very terrifying for a writer. 
So, um, but yeah, I'd say each book from like stem to stern took me about like three years. Hi, Melissa. I'd love to know how you went about your research on eating disorders while writing the book. And if at any point it informed you of something substantial that you may not have known prior. No, you know, I having I have a history of eating disorders. So once you have had eating disorders, you sort of have a PhD in it. It's kind of like um, how there's so, like I have certain friends who are Catholic and are like, well, I know I no longer like practice Catholicism, but like I still have the guilt like it's still with me. Like once you get your PhD in like bad um, or in like unhelpful, like like I guess I could call it like help, like not unhelpful, but in, in like eating disorder knowledge, right? Like once you have your PhD in like how to run an eating disorder, like it's very hard to shake that knowledge. Um, and it's sort of just knowledge, you know, and, and, and I think that it, one interesting question for me is like, what is recovery, right? Like, what does that look like? Um, you know, how healthy of a relate, what is a healthy relationship with food? You know, um, what is intuitive eating? I've never been able to be an intuitive eater. Every time I try to eat intuitively, I binge. So that like didn't work for me, but, um, you know, it's, but so my research was all, um, I'd been carrying it around up here. My sister knows that. My sister's on this. Shout out, big shouts out to my sister Haley, to her husband Sean and my niece Sage. They're in Miami right now. And also to the Canada crew, to Cindy and to Bev and to everyone else who's here from Canada. Love, love a Canadian. Love a Canadian. Okay. Uh, was the choice to make Miriam an Orthodox Jew something you decided at the beginning or something you realized as you were writing? Um, well, so this novel, uh, a version of this, a non jewy version of this book, uh, I wrote as a short story in college. And um, the sort of foil to my eating disordered protagonist, so the Miriam, if you will, was like this, it was like, the, it was the worst short story. It was like basically what made me write poetry for like the next like 12, I was like, I have no business writing prose like ever again. Um, it was bad. But so the the character who then ultimately now, many, many, many years later became Miriam um, was like this earth woman named Gaia. She, it was like horrible. Um, it, it was so bad. And so, but so this has always been a story I've, I've known um, I wanted to tell you know, two, these two women, um, a disordered eater and a, um, very free eater, but who perhaps is not free in some other ways. Um, what happens when they, um, fall for each other, right? Like what are the change, what changes happen in their lives? And, um, and I think it was a couple years ago when I started feeling this, like, um, nostalgia for these these experiences of the Jewish delis of my childhood. Again, I mean, I can go to Canners here. I, you know, I go to Canners, I go to Factors. There's plenty of delis in LA, but like the feeling I get when I walk up to the counter and I like see the Schnecken, like that to me is holy. Like there was something, and it, I just felt like I was drifting further away from some childhood experience of that, you know, because my grandparents have now been dead for a long time. Um, and I think it was like, realizing how integral the my experience of Judaism is to my experience with food and also then thinking about these two characters that I was like okay um and I just knew I just knew I was like Rachel's a reformed Jew who doesn't believe in God and like Miriam is um I knew she was orthodox you know um and some of my research I actually when I was 12 my synagogue did an exchange. My synagogue was very just like, um, sh as I said, like very Chanel bag Jew, not Talmud Jew. Like it was very like, um, like I, I, it wasn't super spiritual experience for me. Although I was in the choir, Junior Jammers, and I always loved the music. Um, junior Jammers was cool, but um, but you know we did an exchange with um, with some Orthodox Jewish families in Borough Park. They didn't come to us because we were heathen, but we went to them. And I was really nervous. I don't love sleeping at people's houses. I like to be in control of my area. It's also why I'm a writer. You can be in control of the narrative. Um, so I love illusions of control. They're like my fave. 
um, the eating disorder, et cetera. So, um, but so I, I was really, I was nervous. I was really scared to go into this like new environment and I didn't know what to expect. And I ended up like loving it. Like I ended up really, like I just got a great family and there was just so much warmth and love there. And um, they really like took me in unconditionally and they were a lot of my um, inspiration for um, Miriam's family in this book. Having said that, um, you know, later on, I also questioned like, wow, like they love me because I'm a Jew. Like, what if I wasn't a Jew, you know? And this started to raise some questions for me that are, that are appear in the book. The see Rachel asking some of those types of questions. Um, what is unconditional? Like how, how unconditional is unconditional love, right? Or tribal. Um, okay. The glossary of inspiration is everything I wanted right now. Brilliant. No question. Just wanted to ask that. Okay. Um, all right, cool. I, oh, I can see I've got my So Sad Today fans asking some questions. Okay. Why is visiting a cemetery a must? Well, it's not a must for everybody. So, um, I, lo I love cemeteries. My So Sad Today fans know that. Um, and because um, like the few picked, I don't love selfies, but like the few selfies I'll take are like often in a cemetery. Um, I think for me, it's the same reason why maybe when, um, well, I'll say it like this. I feel like in this, in this society, I feel like we are, um, I personally feel like pretty disconnected from like death and the dying process. And then when it comes into your life, it's like a surprise and it's weird and it's jarring and it's anxiety inducing and you're reminded that you're going to die. Like death isn't a huge part of life. I feel my daily life, you know, like the reality that I'm going to die. Not, I know this is like a little heavy for like a Thursday, but, um, you know, but to me, it's important, like knowing I'm going to die probably should inform how I live my life, right? Like knowing that my time is finite, um, knowing even just down, even down to like, I was thinking the other day, cause I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to write this, this novel, uh, next that like was in a drawer and not to, you know, and I was like, okay, you're going to die. You only have so much time. What do you need to write now? You know, like, what do you need to write next? And, you know, it, I think death can like really beautifully inform our life, but I feel like we're very disconnected or I'm very disconnected. Um, and so I guess being in a cemetery, um, it's like a, I think cemeteries are beautiful, especially like, um, the ones in France, um, two years ago I got to, well, I, uh, Père Lachaise is beautiful, but two years ago I got to go to one in, um, uh, Montparnasse and it was like I just hung out there for like three hours um and um by myself and it, I don't know I just like it it's like the flowers and um the poetry and um and also just like there's it's real you know I thought I wanted to be cremated I always thought I wanted to be cremated but now I'm starting to think that I might actually um want to be buried more on that soon okay we definitely want to know your philosophy on the afterlife. Also milk fed. Can't wait for my copy, copy of Sizzler on the Roof. Oh yeah, so for those, Twizzler on the Roof. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I did a pre-order thing for milk fed where I made a recipe booklet of recipes from the book um, and I call it Twizzler on the Roof um, for people who pre-ordered from, from certain indie stores who participated. Um, but yeah, so Twizzler on the Roof. Um, but the recipes were like, it was like, Plain hunk of cream cheese eaten alone in emotional catharsis on kitchen floor. Like nothing, it's nothing you actually want to replicate. My views on the afterlife, it's kind of like my views on, um, like I, I, I'm very, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm very, um, like I do, I, well, I'm not going to get into like my beliefs on God, but basically what I'll say is that um, for me, I feel like God is real enough in the sense that, um, you know, I have a relationship with, uh, with a higher power. It changes all the time, like any long-term relationship. Sometimes it's just this like very quiet, still small voice that I feel is always in me. Um, ultimately, I don't think I know. I, I don't think I'll ever know with my mind, just like I don't think I'll ever know with my mind if there's life after death or if there's not, or what it would look like, you know? Um, and so, 
but the not knowing, I feel like, I don't know. I really, I, this is why certitude perplexes me because I feel like there's so much richness in the not knowing and in the mystery, you know, like I love, I like the potentiality. So I don't know, you know, um, my views, my view is that I know very little. My view is that I know very little, but I do believe that, um, just through my own experiences that, um, you know, if I, if I want to believe like what I, I, in some ways I feel like whatever we believe, um, is when it comes to, when it comes to the spirit. Um, and so, but I just don't know yet. Like, I mean, I, I don't think I want to be reincarnated. I, I just can't deal with this again. You know, it's like a lot living in a body. Um, okay. But I would love like Nirvana. Like, I mean, ideally I just want to be like in a million particles, like just, you know, the cosmic consciousness, like fucking like Atman, like just mm, like the light. I want to be the light, you know, anyway. Um, but who knows? Maybe I'll be a bug. Okay. As you publish more work in your own name, what has it been like continuing So Sad Today on Twitter and through the podcast? How has So Sad Today affected Melissa and vice versa? So I feel like So Sad Today at this point is really, um, well, Twitter, the Twitter element. I like doing the podcast a lot. Um, it's really enjoyable for me because I'm a ham. For those of you who don't know, I have a, well, I call it a shod because I hate, because sh- I call it a shod cast because I didn't want to have a podcast. So I, it's like a show. I call it a show. It's a show, but then I ended up calling it like a shodcast. But anyway, I have a, a show. I have a show. It's like me talking into my phone in my car to like five people. But um, I like doing it because I'm a ham, you know? Sometimes it feels a little overwhelming. I'm like, oh, why did I get myself into this? But I do really like doing it, you know? Because as a writer, it's like you grow up and all you want are like people to like, you just like, you get so excited to have like people actually want to listen to you and like read your work. So that's like really cool. Um, but it's called, yeah, it's called eating alone in my car and I just recorded in the car eating something it's different every week, but, and I just like talk about nothing basically. But, um, but in terms of the so sad today, Twitter, to me, Twitter is a very different place than it was. I feel like there's a lot more, um, people of certitude on Twitter now. Um, when I first started tweeting as so sad today anonymously, um, Twitter seemed to me a lot more of a creative place. There, you know, I liked weird Twitter um, and it wasn't quite as algorithmed and monetized and it was more of a wild west. Um, and I really used it as like this journal into nothingness to kind of cope with um, anxiety and um, depression and anonymously. I mean, the account was anonymous for years. I was literally tweeting into the void. Um, so I used it as a coping skill when I was working in an office and I didn't like I didn't really know what to do you know, so I just sort of like tweeted it. Um, and it was stuff that I didn't feel like I could tweet from my personal account. And now I feel like the lay of the land has really changed. And I almost feel myself being manipulated by like, um, it's like a slot machine, you know? And so for me now, so sad today is it's the dregs of a dopamine, dopamine addiction is really what it is. And I actually don't know that it's the healthiest tool for me anymore. It's like, um, well, like, it's like, I can either like I have a feeling and I can either like feel a feeling and like process it and like move through it or I can like tweet about it and get some dopamine and like not process it, you know, but I can like make something funny about it. And and like, I mean, obviously I choose B, you know, I'm like, oh, sit in a feeling that or and like be an adult or like make a like funny missive and get dopamine about it like B. But I think that it would probably behoove me to choose A more. You know what I'm saying? So we'll see. I think, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to the So Sad Today Twitter. Um, for those of you who like it, though, I mean, you can you can rest assured that um, it remains a compulsion for me. So it'll probably be around for, for a little longer. Um, okay. I think so. Okay. I'll, I'll answer one more question really, really quickly. I have 33 seconds. Okay. Assuming you're constantly living with the discomfort of being alive and having a body, if writing is your way of escaping from despair, do you grieve the period between books? Um, That's a really good question. I think it's not as much a grief as it is a feeling of meaninglessness and peril and terror of nothingness. 
uh, that's sort of, as I've been hemming and hawing of what, like what is, what's, I, I thought I was gonna write this new novel. Now I'm thinking like, oh, maybe I might write some nonfiction. I don't know. But I'm like, you like, I'm like, you better get this figured out. And like, it's just like so mean, you know? Like I just wrote a fucking novel and I wrote a fucking novel before that. And I'm like, you you better fit, you better figure this out, Missy. So um, yeah, I'm just like, it's more of like, like what, what, like who, what, you know? It's more probably the way I'd feel about life if I like was never writing, you know? Just kind of like what, like why? what is this existent? But luckily there is reading. Reading brings me great joy. So thank you all so much for coming. That was amazing. <laughs> Yay, congratulations. That, wow, I've never, you're the first like solo presenter we've had so it's just fascinating oh my god you have these your appetites thank you for all those appetites and for everything that you've shared with us tonight um i think we've got like some comments coming in on the chat now um and just thank you for being with books and books and there we go crowd goes wild <laughs> You're amazing, Melissa, thank you. Thank you, that was really fun. So I just wanna remind everybody, you can buy the book at Books and Books. So get your copy, we'll ship it right out to you. You can come by the store if you're in Miami and uh, take it home with you. We have curbside pickup if you need it. This is a great book. You wanna add this to your collection. So yeah. please, um, and thank you. I mean, we, uh, we have a lot of people watching from all over the place. Yeah. If you see the green bar, I should have said this during the thing. I feel like we're on QVC because you don't see when they're like, you have 46 seconds left to buy. So everybody, two minutes left to buy milk fed on the green bar. And you know, I always say like, touch it. They're like this is a book. This is a book. This book, it's it's very, it, it will act as skincare. <laughs> Book, it will act as if you if you push the green button. This book acts as it serves as skincare. It serves as hi Jody. It serves you can hug the book. The book serves as a nice warm blanket. You also you do not get pickle is not included in the package. He's unimpressed. Pickle, thank you. But yes, hit the green button. Thank you okay. so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was so fun to get to do Miami because my sister and everyone's in Miami right now. So it was fun. Yay. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I guess we'll say good night. Good night.